But I think great leaders often transcend their political moment and they unite the common people towards more permanent ends than politics. Obviously, as a political leader, you have to get elected, right? So you have to you have to win the battle, right? And that often means going to bat for the team that you're on. But I think it's really important for our political leaders to have a vision for the flourishing of the whole. Welcome back to The Kevin Roberts Show. You are in store for a real treat today. Yes, we're talking about a book and a book about statesmanship, something that should interest all of us. But most importantly, we're talking to one of the most important leaders in this country, someone who, even still at a relatively young age, is one of the leaders of the American conservative movement. And so even if you're not a conservative, you should listen because what my guest, my friend, Johnny Burka, the president and CEO of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, has to say is something that potentially could give you a new understanding, not just of statesmanship, but of American history and of America. So with that, Johnny Burka, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me, Kevin. So we're going to talk about your wonderful book for those viewing, The Gateway to Statesmanship. And it's something that I reviewed today and highly recommend. And I say that not just because I kind of have to as your friend and as a board member of ISI, but truly because it's a really good book. Um, But before we get into the book, Tell us what the Intercollegiate Studies Institute is. Absolutely. So ISI was founded in 1953 by William F. Buckley Jr. And the the mission of ISI is to save Western civilization. So we do this by educating college students in the principles of America and the West, going all the way back to Jerusalem, Athens, Rome, London, Philadelphia, uh, giving them the education that they're not getting in the classroom. But more importantly, we're building a countercultural leadership network. So we're identifying the most virtuous, the most ambitious, talented students on the best campuses around the country. We're bringing them together. We're educating them. And then it's those friendships and those relationships that five, 10 years from now will go on to uh, staff presidential administrations, hopefully serve on the Supreme Court, found companies, work at places like the Heritage Foundation. Well, and, and for a long time, I mean, several decades, if you think about how long ISI has been around, ISI has been countercultural. It has been a, a resource for students who feel disaffected, perhaps even disenfranchised mm-hmm. on their college campuses. But what I hear more and more from, from older friends who have you know, all of their kids, maybe all of their grandkids now in college is a question, and that is, Kevin, where can my children or grandchildren go on these college campuses to hear something that's relatively normal? One of the answers to that question is actually ISI. Absolutely. What are some of the programs that, that, that people might look into? You, you touched on that just now, but I think maybe we've piqued the interest of some folks. Who yeah, are definitely. So we have, we have lectures, seminars, debates, reading groups. We do summer schools for college students. And then we have a journalism program, which actually is a network of over 80 campus newspapers where we identify and train journalists. We build the uh, student newspapers' websites, and we help to, to hold, in many cases, the, the administrations at the colleges accountable. So you've led ISI now for a few years? Yeah, three and a half years. What's, what's your story of coming into this, this role? Because those of us who do what we do for a living, that is work professionally in the conservative movement, know that ISI is one of the important institutions, not just on the political right, but in the United States uh, period. What's your, what was your path to, to come into this position? Yeah, definitely. Great question. So ISI is actually the oldest organization in the conservative movement, founded in 1953. Uh, so my path actually began um, at Hillsdale College. So I, I grew up um, in, in, I was actually a townie. So I grew up in Hillsdale County, went to the local public high school, actually had a wonderful experience with my friends and family there, but I had not read any great book really in my whole life. When, when they came, when I came to my Hillsdale interview, they, they said, you know, what great books have formed you? And I said, I don't know, the Bible, Romeo and Juliet. I mean, that was basically all I had. So coming to Hillsdale was really a full immersion experience into Western civilization. And I just fell in love with the, the great tradition and studied under Dr. Arne uh, and took several courses, of course, on Aristotle and on C.S. Lewis with him. And that's really where my sort of intellectual life and interest in, in conservative thought um, grew and developed. 
And uh, finally, in my mid-20s after grad school, decided to get back into the political world. And uh, Dr. Arn helped me to get my first job at ISI. I worked in development there for a couple years. Then I left for four and ended up becoming the executive director and the acting editor of the American Conservative magazine here in Washington. And then three and a half years ago, went back to ISI as president. Where I will say, as one of your newer board members, you've done a fantastic job. Thank you. Uh, not just in what, what needs to happen day to day behind the scenes in an organization which is managing it, but also in addition to that important work, the external side of that. And, and one of the most important public-facing roles of ISI and particularly of its leader is to, to connect the best lessons from the past mm -hmm. to what we're doing in the present and hopefully a more hopeful future. And I think that's where your book comes in. So tell us what the inspiration of Gateway to Statesmanship was. Absolutely. So, so think of this. Most people in your audience and in America are familiar with this genre of business book. Something like Jim Collins' Good to Great or Peter Thiel Zero to One. The New York Times bestselling list, less bestseller list is filled with these titles every single year. And people are really longing for self-help advice. How do I be a good leader? And in America, you know, and rightfully so, we're leaders in business. So there's a million books on business. There's not a single comparable book for how do you be a great statesman? What does it take? And this is actually a historic anomaly in nearly every culture in civilization going back to antiquity from Greece, Rome, uh, and, you know, the Judeo-Christian tradition, all the way to ancient China and India. They had these short leadership books. And as you know from you know, working with political leaders, right, they're busy people. I mean, I'm sure if you opened up their phone, they probably get 100, 200 text messages a day. You know, I think it's easy for us to think, okay, why don't our leaders, why aren't they courageous? Why aren't they principled? Why don't they just get it? You know, and, and I think what this book is trying to do and what this genre called the Mirrors for Princes, which I essentially put a collection of these classic texts together, is trying to, to connect first principles to actual practical lifestyle advice that a busy little political leader or aspiring political leader can implement in their life to be more courageous, to be more virtuous, to be more just on a daily basis. So give give us an example of, of one or two of these chapters, in essence, in, in the book. Sure. So, uh, there, you know, there's a, f a few different ones that, that stand out to me. Um, the one, the more modern one that I've included is Charles de Gaulle's The Edge of the Sword. This is a little known and read book, but it's it's absolutely amazing. So basically, he's 30, early 30s, probably 33 years old. During World War I, he was a prisoner of war, but he really didn't do much. He smoked cigarettes and he read old books for, for a couple years. And But he spent a lot of time thinking about political leadership and what kind of uh, leader and man he wanted to become. And so after he um, the war was over, he sat down and he wrote this sh very short book called The Edge of the Sword. And there are these sections on character and on prestige where he's drawing from uh, Aristotle's ethics and Aristotle's portrait of a magnanimous man. And he's describing the qualities that he would like to see in a leader. And then he with great energy, you know, devotes the rest of his life to becoming that leader, uh, leading the resistance to the Nazi invasion of France, founding the Fifth French Republic, and serving as uh, its president for 10 years. So, like, that's a, a recent example, and uh, it's just powerful advice that, that any aspiring leader could implement. Uh, and then if I... Uh, backtrack, the very first essay in the book is Xenophon's The Education of Cyrus. So this is a story that uh, the British poet Sir Philip Sidney said, it's such a powerful portrait of a leader that by putting it in a narrative form, uh, it has the potency to create many more Cyruses who read it later, right? And so this, this is basically the story of a, a conqueror, a fictionalized version of Cyrus, who basically conquers from modern day Persia all the way to Greece, and then ends up ruling this empire that he conquers. And it follows the story of his education when he was a young boy and really talks to something that I think you're, you've are you been getting at with the, the education issues in this country is that when uh, educational standards are heightened, you know, teaching excellence, teaching the moral virtues, teaching restraint, a civilization flourishes. But when they're loosened, right, men and women become weak and the civil civilization collapses. So the whole book really unpacks how this education he received as a young, boy shaped him into the leader that he was and then how did he lead his men throughout these various battles and what did leadership look like uh, governing after he was victorious uh, as opposed to when he was conquering so that's a taste of a couple different and stories. those I mean those are those two examples are, are, are really emblematic of, of the entire book and they're each of them very powerful 
as I listen to your explanation of Xenophon, I, I can imagine that some members of the audience are asking, why didn't I learn about that? Or why didn't my children learn about that? Which leads to the, well, at Heritage, we would call sort of a policy question, which sure. we can get into, but it's really, it's even bigger than that. It's social and cultural and institutional. What has happened? This yeah. is the question, Johnny. What has happened to American education that probably a lot of people are asking that question? Definitely. So I think there's two two parts to, you know, why didn't I, I read it? I would say the, the one is the educational part, and the education system is guilty of, you know, what C.S. Lewis described as presentism. Basically, if it wasn't written in the last 10 minutes, we're not going to pay attention to it because it's either stained with the, the guilt of, of various sins from the past, or maybe in most cases, they're just ignorant of it and they're not aware. And so there's been a, a shift away from uh, moral philosophy and theology in favor of the social sciences. And I think to get to the origin of that, you have to go back to the progressive movement, the early progressive movement. And specifically on the topic of statesmanship, uh, you know, thinking about the administrative state here in Washington, D.C., it's premised, it, it's very uncomfortable with the idea of statesmanship, you know, a great man or a great woman, uh, you know, holding the rudder of, of state, sort of navigating through the virtue of prudence, the ship through, you know, rough waters. It's much safer if you have in their so telling an expert class based here in Washington, D.C., who can use bureaucratic means, who can use social science, who can use data to really manage society, you know, to try to even mitigate or even eliminate the negative effects of, of human nature. And so there's a, a management based approach to leadership as opposed to a, a, an approach based in classical moral thought. How do we solve that problem? To ask you a small question. Yeah, it's a, it's a. That's a million dollar question. Obviously, we have to build our own institutions. And in part of this book really gets to the heart of, you know, leaders in previous uh, eras and in previous civilizations gave careful thought to the qualities that they wanted to see in their political leaders in particular. And secondly, they then created the educational institutions needed to disseminate that knowledge to the next generation. Now, if you go back to ancient Israel, you'll see that nearly every generation, you know, you have a wicked, rotten king who brings in all sorts of false gods and a small group of people band together. They identify the future leaders. They educate them in, you know, in the law and the prophets. And they uh, sort of rebuild the foundations and then good leaders emerge and they, you know, uh, banish the, the false gods and restore a sense of order and, and virtue. And then their kids are corrupt and then the cycle just repeats, you know. And so I do think uh, I am uh, an optimist. Maybe I, I put it, I'm more hopeful, right? Hopeful because I believe that, you know, we are, we are, things are particularly dire in America right now, but there are these cycles that happen in, in, in any regime. And I think there's a, a big opportunity. And I see this through the classical education movement. I see it through sco schools like Hillsdale. I see it through the work of ISI, which is both a, a counter uh, to the university, but is also operating within the university, hosting programs on college campuses. And I think there are more people today, your average American is, is um, they, they see the, the decadence of our current political moment and they're hungry for an alternative. So I actually feel better about America's position um, today than I did four years ago. And, and to some extent, that's because things are worse than they were four years ago. But also, I think your your average person, but also I think people at, at elite levels, you know, people like Elon Musk at, at Twitter, people even you're starting to see in the business community, I think probably people paying attention to your remarks at Davos saying, you know, things have actually been pretty terrible the last four years and Americans really aren't stupid for wanting an alternative. Yeah, the, the, there's there's so much there in that wonderful response, but where my mind goes is is uh, two paths. We'll talk about one, which is political leaders and political leadership right now. But before we get that get there, I think the the, the other path is about institutions. Hmm. And and what I mean by that, Johnny, is people can say, well, there's Hillsdale, there's ISI, there's Heritage. Thankfully, there are several other institutions of. You know, nonprofits, schools, policy organizations, so on, and others that we can count on, but it's a diminishing number. But when often I'm out on the road and I say, well, we need to get busy about founding new institutions, often people respond in a very rational way, which is, that's a lot of work, they say. But it's also necessary work. And 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 so when we talk about politicians, we'll be talking about the short term. Sure. But what do you say to someone who 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 wants to help? They understand the importance of of 
correcting the disease of institutions and or starting new institutions, which might be a, a school. It might be, mm-hmm. for that matter, you know, some association or club in their neighborhood. Are we ascribing enough the, the right amount of power to that solution mm-hmm. for the everyday person to be part of. Is well, I mean, anything that's, that's um, you know, worth doing is worth doing well, and that's going to require, you know, struggle and difficulty. A little bit of effort. And, a little bit of effort, right? Um, now, but I would say at the same time, if I think back to my own childhood, um, the, the public school that I went to, right, it was the lifeblood of the community. Like, there was no community existent outside of that high school the you know the sports teams everything it was if you wanted to be honored within that community if you wanted to be great as a young person you had to make your name for yourself at that public school and on that football field or on the basketball court um and uh so i do think for your for your average person who says you know this is where this is where my kids going and this is where all our friends are this is where all the families that we know send their kids i do think it it does come at a great price to say we're going to do something different we're going to build something new from the, the bottom up and there's may, maybe even a fear and you know is my kid going to be normal like the other kids are they going to have friends if we chart this course um and uh but i but i think it's probably it, it's it's one of those things that's difficult but probably not as difficult as people imagine because there are so many resources available for people who want to um either homeschool or start a small school you know in terms of curriculum in terms of uh, institutions that are willing to provide support that leads to this question you in your description of de gaulle and i want to come back to him momentarily you you referred to him as as being countercultural to say the least is that a theme in some of the leaders some of the statesmen you cover is a is a recognition that part of their demonstrating their leadership Mm -hmm. part of being what you and i would recognize as a statesman Mm -hmm. is recognizing that whatever the prevailing notions of the day are Mm -hmm. they may not be right Mm -hmm. and having the courage to stand up to them that is a that is a big part of it. Uh, so I think there's two sort of characters in the, this book. There are the the counselors. There's the educators, and most of them get killed <laughs> in rather gruesome ways. Sort of a bad because ending. they're you know advi- they're they're offering advice for political leaders who are ambitious and who want to wield sole authority. And if someone is saying, "Hey, you know, excuse me, you know, you sh- probably shouldn't be doing that, or you should think about doing something differently," they don't take too kindly to it. And so, um, but they do in the long run impact generations beyond the leader that they're advising with some of these books being, you know, some of the most popular books that have been written for, for thousands of years. So as long as you're willing to be murdered. As long as you're willing to be murdered. You, you know, can be a great statesman. You can be a great statesman. You know, uh, Thomas More said, I, you know, I died the king's good servant, but God's first. Uh, and so he counseled the king up into the point where his conscience wouldn't allow it. And then he gave his life for that. Uh, in terms of great leaders, um, I think they they absolutely do recognize that right that something is that something's off now i think many of them end up rising above the the kind of the political moment so often you might see this example of there are two sort of conflicting sides and i'm not, I'm not saying here that we should be uh, i'm not saying we should be bipartisan because i think that has a that for for good reasons that has a bad uh, connotations you know here in washington but i think great leaders often transcend their political moment, and they unite the common people towards more uh, permanent ends than politics. And so I think leadership requires two things. There's that transcendent moral vision, which is pointing uh, a society or a you know political body towards um, towards the good and even towards God's God Himself, and then there's a, a second component which I think is the 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 common good, and a leader is really championing the flourishing of the whole body politic. And I think it is important that you know obviously if, as a political leader you have to get elected right, so you have to you have to win the battle right, and that often means going to bat for the team that you're on. But I think it's really important for our political leaders to have a vision for the flourishing of the whole. Um, and I think that's a hallmark of a great leader. So where I want to go next is is exclusively our American context, mm-hmm. which, which I know concerns you every day, and it, it certainly does me, and probably everyone in the audience. And 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 I want to riff off of this this comment you just made about a transcendent moral vision. It's a little bit of a devil's advocate question, maybe a lot of a devil's okay. advocate question, but but exclusively for, for with that motivation. And it is. Do enough Americans still believe in the same transcendent moral vision for there to be us to expect a leader or a generation of leaders whose statesmanship can r- mm-hmm. rest on that? 
See, I think uh, it's a question of, well, you never know, right, what's in, in, in people's hearts. But we know that everyone, every citizen of America is a human being, right? So they have this innate desire. You know, a human being is a, is a, is a worshiping being, right? They crave God or gods, right? They, there's a, this desire in a human being. And so I think that every good leader in every era, even of American history, every great leader certainly is, is calling out that even that spiritual dimension of the human person, and it's pointing them towards something higher. I think you saw this right after 9-11, right? The people hungered for coming together. They hungered, or they rallied around the flag, but they also rallied in prayer. And people who probably haven't prayed their whole life were praying after 9-11 in ways that they weren't before. So I think it's, yeah, it's, it's in human nature, and a good leader can, can help call that out. So... You don't necessarily have to name names. That's not the purpose of my question, but feel free to. Are there statesmen in America today who stand out to you? That's a tough. That's a tough question. Um, you know, I think of uh, someone who I look up to greatly, which is Robert Lighthizer, mm -hmm. um, who was the U.S. Trade Representative uh, for President Trump. And the reason that I think he's a great statesman as you have an issue like China and you go all the way back 20, 30 years ago and he was writing op-eds in the New York Times saying, whoa, 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 you know, China should not enter the World Trade Organization. Um, you know, I know what their what their vision is, you know, for, for the world, right? Not just for China. And he was right on that issue when no one was willing to be right. And uh, when the, the so you see, here's the other thing is that great leaders um, they're emergent, right? You don't necessarily get to pick them. They come to the fore mm. when there's a combination of virtue and fortune, and these two things align. So George Washington, if he was born 10 years earlier or 10 years later, we may have never have heard of him. The U.S. might not exist the way that it mm. did. So I think in a, in a, I say smaller way, not to d diminish um, uh, Mr. Lighthizer, who wasn't the president, right, but he was at the, the highest levels of American life, I think has helped uh, to totally reorient uh, America's position towards China, not just economically, but even militarily. Uh, and I think that's the work of, of a statesman is to, to both identify a problem that, don't, that other people don't see, to be courageous in, in stepping forward, and then also to have that, that blend of not just uh, you know, book knowledge, but also the street smart to be able to kind of get these deals done and, and, and sort of bring it about a paradigm shift that other people will be living in the world that he built for the next 30 years. So what do you say to someone who fashions himself or herself a potential statesman? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, we hope that they have that aspiration, sure. right? It's, it's, a, it's a significant aspiration. Maybe it's, it's someone who's currently mm -hmm. an elected official. Maybe it's someone who's looking, listening, or, or, or watching this, and they say, I, I want to be an elected official, or like Mr. Lighthizer, not an elected official, but in a in a, in a role sure. of public service. And I, I'm inspired by what Johnny is is saying in this book about statesmanship. What are the kinds of things they need to be doing, even mm -hmm. though we have to account for the fact that some of this is organic? Sure, it's, it's outside their control. Yeah, it is. Um, so uh, there's. Yeah, that's these, these are good questions. I'm looking, so for that's the, actually, I'm looking for the lesson plan, Johnny. The lesson plan. <laughs> yeah, I mean the. Uh, so the Cicero describes the sh what he calls a shortcut to greatness. There we go. This um, is, this is yeah. what I'm fishing for. So and and basically, the Cicero's sh shortcut to greatness is fake it till you make it, right? But what he means by that is the fastest way to become the type of person that you would like to be is to start pretending you're that person, right? Start dressing like that person. Start talking like them. Start reading the things that they would be reading. Uh, and the second thing is to start surrounding yourself with people that are both virtuous, but also doing the type of things that you want to do. Because the reality is that, you know, you sort of almost have to kind of trick yourself, right? Because it's, it's hard to be good. It's even harder to be great, right? And so the first thing is you start pretending that you're a great person. And the more that you pretend, the more that other people are going to start taking you seriously and the more you'll start to take yourself seriously and then the second thing is that you often people rise to the level of the people that they spend their time with now obviously if i start hanging out with tiger woods i'm not gonna ever you know it's impossible that i'll become as good at golf as he is but i think in the realm of statesmanship i think it's very true that you do rise to the level of the people that people that are of your peers right and um i think of someone like jd vance who um, you know, five or six years ago, you know, his, his book, uh, 
uh, Hillbilly Elegy came out. I remember going down to New Orleans. He did an event for us with TAC, hanging out with him. And he was, you know, amazing. He was a great guy who I, you know, came to know somewhat well. But here, here we are, fast forward five, six years down the road, and he's a senator. And that's a pretty quick um, a pretty quick rise. Now, he did have a New York Times bestselling book and a Netflix documentary about his life, which I'm sure helped. Um, but I don't think it's as, I don't think the odds are as insurmountable as people think, especially if you surround yourself with people that are both uh, good, but also well-connected. And maybe the second two things, because I think power does play a big role in this, is you you have to, you know, hopefully believe the right principles and have the skill set that's needed for kind of flourishing in a political setting. But I think the second two things that are always uh, helpful to have, if not essential, is the second one is connections. You have to have people that are connected um, at the highest levels, right? And I remember when I uh, uh, not to say that I have any particular power, uh, but I remember a decade ago when I was just, you know, out of college and I came to Washington, D.C., and I would just sleep on people's couches and I'd have, the, you know, the, the names of the various thinkers and scholars that I thought were interesting. And I'd just reach out to friends who I thought knew them and they would connect me and I'd just randomly meet up with them for coffee just because I would beg them to meet up, meet me for coffee. Like I'm just a, a nobody, you know kid fresh out of college, you know, and it was just sort of like, slowly but surely, I just met everyone that I ever wanted to meet just by pounding on their door, you know, and so I think, you know, so that's the second thing. There's a certain amount of hustle. Yeah, you have to hustle and build the connections. And then the third one is financial resources, which most people don't have on their own. But I think, uh, you know, people take take people more seriously if they have people that are willing to back them. If it's a company, right, you're a founder, you need investors willing to get behind you. If you're in politics, you need donors who are willing to support your campaign. Uh, If you're a a think tank leader, a nonprofit leader, you also need financial supporters. And so I think it's it's kind of that that mix. You need knowledge, you need experience, you need connections, and you need financial resources. And and just get over the imposter syndrome. Get over the (laughs) imposter syndrome, yeah. So let's let's pivot at least slightly from the book, and, and this has been been uh, I think a great summary of the book, and thank you for writing it. To something that the book I think is is helpful in understanding, which is not just leadership in the United States today, but sort of the, a, an assessment of the cultural social situation mm-hmm. we're in. What's the biggest problem facing the United States? I think ultimately, I mean, the biggest problem facing the United States. Oh, man, these are this, this is a tough question. Um, I mean, I think there's I, I think I ultimately think it comes down to a spiritual problem, right? I think if you get the the foundations of religious faith correct, uh, that that is actually the foundation of culture and of civilization itself. And so I think if there was a a, a revival, not only in individuals' hearts, but it, you know, in the broader swaths of the population, I think that's a foundation for getting the country right. I think there's other problems that are very, you know, on the heels of that is the education issue. Um, and I think you can trace most of the problems facing America, whether it's the thirty-three trillion dollars in debt, whether it's wokeness, whether it's um, America's approach to conflicts abroad, uh, all of that, the, the crises of our leadership class, all of that can be traced back to the university, the contemporary university system and its failures, particularly since the 1960s. So there's something that needs to change, I, I would agree emphatically, about America's spiritual health, sure. if you will. And I think we agree that there's something that needs to change in the in the political sphere probably a lot that needs to change sure. in, the, in the political sphere, which also means that we have to have men and women in the political sphere, broadly defined, whether mm-hmm. in, in elected office or, or not, who come in with the mindset of being statesmen. Mm-hmm. We, we, in other words, and you know where I'm going with this probably by now, which is toward Project 2025, mm-hmm. of which ISI is a, a key part, we need men and women to come into the next administration who aren't just competent, mm-hmm hopefully excellent professionally, but who have the mindset of the people you cover in your book, right? Because otherwise it's just sort of a more conservative technocratic exercise. Yeah. 
And so Thomas St. Thomas More is the perfect person to understand this. So in his in his book Utopia, which is included in this collection, he's having this debate with with a, a fictional character named Raphael, who's a traveling intellectual. And he says, you know, oh, Raphael, you know, you're so wise. You have all this experience. Why don't you lend your services, get involved with politics, you know, enter a, a court, you know, offer a king uh, your counsel. And, and Raphael says, oh, no, you know, I, I couldn't possibly do that. You know, a, a king or a political leader would never listen to me. They'd trample on all my ideas. They wouldn't, they're not nuanced enough. They're not thoughtful enough. They wouldn't get it right. And, um, and I, I don't want to get my hands dirty in politics. And Thomas More rebukes him, you know, and says, the reason that this regime is so corrupt like it is now is because uh, intellectuals and philosophers won't descend to offer their counsel to kings. And so he, he basically says, look, you have to, you can never abandon the ship in a storm because you can't control the winds. Um, you know, we're, we're all like actors. We're called on the stage. We don't get to pick the play. You know, it's, if it's Hamlet, we don't get to say, hey, change it to King Lear, right? We have to make the best of the situation that we're in. And and I think really this tradition is calling people to live the active life. And so I think this is even a, a challenge for conservatives. Uh, in part, we built so many wonderful new educational institutions that do fo- focus on getting the uh, the book learning part of this right. But that, you know, that sort of exercise in virtue that's filled out actually in the arena. And so I think Project 2025 is a it's a call for for young you know men and women to actually get in the arena and fight to save our regime. Yeah. And what I really appreciate as I have this conversation with you today, more than I ever have about Project 2025, is that it isn't just a policy exercise. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, I knew that. It wasn't merely that, sure. although that's important enough. It isn't just an exercise of, of assisting the next president. And it isn't just an exercise of selfless service mm-hmm. by a bunch of individuals to the United States. It really is an opportunity for men and women in positions that, for the most part, won't have a lot of limelight mm-hmm. to exhibit the virtues of the people you covered That's in right. your book. So your book is really timely. Thank you. I appreciate that. One final question, although we hope to have you back many times over the years. And and that is, I, I know you to be a hopeful person that's rooted in your faith, rooted in your study of this country. And yet, as just thinking about the difficult topics we, we covered in this conversation, there are a lot of challenges hmm. facing the United States. I'm curious how hopeful you are about the American future. Mm-hmm. And to the degree that you are, what does that rest on? Yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful, I think, by nature. You know, that's sort of my disposition. But I think my hope is, I mean, it's it's born in two things. One, it's, it's you know, at ISI, we're, we're on, you know, hundreds of college campuses. And so I see what the next generation of young conservative leaders like, and they are more courageous, more principled. I mean, if you compare 10 years ago, the average ISI student to today, um, 10 years ago, they were, they were nothing against ISI 10 years ago. I, you know, I worked there basically 10 years ago, but I would say they were more, they, they were in a time at which being a conservative was more, uh, tolerated by the mainstream. And so I think they learned to be kind of the, the pet conservative that, you know, could, could come on the various talk shows and, and write columns for all the big papers. And they were respectable, even though they were kind of quirky and different, right? Now the whole thing has shifted, you know, and I saw this in your, your interview um, in the New York Times this past week, where it's, it's shifted because the, it's, it's a hostile world. It's a negative world. And so the people that are going to be conservatives, they're not just going along with the flow. You know, they're not fine being sort of the pet who gets wheeled out, you know, to be the token conservative. They're taking great professional risks for standing on their principles in college at those early years. And so the rest of their life, they're going to be branded um, in a certain way. And so they're just much more courageous. And so as that generation grows up, I'm hopeful for the country. The second thing, and I think that this gets to really the supporters of the Heritage Foundation, is for the past 10 years, I've been traveling in the country, meeting with men and women who've supported Heritage and ISI and so many other good groups. And I've got to see their character and see the things that they believe in and see how they've raised, raised their families and the businesses they've built, how they've contributed not just to the economy, but also to the moral flourishing of this country. And I couldn't think of a better group of people. And so it gives me hope, you know, encountering just so many quality patriotic Americans across the country. So as I look at things, I see these these uh, bastions of, of light, both in the next generation, but also in, in the people supporting heritage. So it's a matter of, of 
recognizing that a lot of that is organic. I mean, it comes from the nature of individuals, but also it's a matter of harnessing hmm. a lot of that energy, a lot of that talent, right? People, yeah, and people are ready for that talent and energy to be harnessed. You know, they're, I think they're, I mean, they're fed up, you know, more so than they were four years ago with how things are. And I think they're ready for a change. And I think it's getting, that message is getting beyond just the heritage donors or just the ISI students. I think your, your everyday American is ready for something new. It definitely seems that we're on the cusp of turning the corner if yeah. we haven't turned it yet. Johnny Burka, President and CEO of Intercollegiate Studies Institute. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So I told you you would enjoy the conversation. Get out there and or don't get out there. Just sit at your computer and order a copy of Johnny's book, Gateway to Statesmanship. Look him up at isi.org, right? And beyond that, keep your chin up. There's a, there are a lot of challenges facing the United States and for that matter, the entire world. But with good people who are willing to take a stand, we're going to win. Take care. The Kevin Roberts Show is brought to you by more than half a million members of the Heritage Foundation. The executive producer is Crystal Kate Bonham. The producer is Philip Reynolds. Sound design by Lauren Evans, Mark Guiney, and Tim Kennedy. For more information and to subscribe, please visit heritage.org.